Hello, good evening, friends. We are back good again. Good evening, sir. Yeah, good evening, Asti. We are back again with uh, another case. This time it is a gynecology case. And we selected this case because it is one of the commonest problems that we come across in any gynecology OPD, that is abnormal uterine bleeding. And I thought this is very, very important from the examination point of view also. There have been lots of changes in the topic. Uh, when I was a PG, that is almost 40 years ago, we used to have a chapter called DUB, but that chapter is now been replaced by chapter called AUB. So Asti, thank you for volunteering to do this case discussion. And um, yes, sir. let's go ahead. But before we go, as usual, let's catch up with a little bit of theory and then we'll move on to the case proper. Is that fine? Yes, sir. Yeah, because um, I'm not sure whether the PGs, especially the new ones, they are very sure about the new terminologies. So we will go ahead that way. What do you mean by AUB, this new terminology that we I was talking about? And what is its impact or importance in gynecology? Sir, AUB is uh, menstrual bleeding of abnormal quantity, duration, and schedule. Yes, and, so you uh, have it to is... talk slowly uh, for people to understand. Yes, you perfectly said it. It's an abnormal bleeding. So what is the abnormality here? It is quantity as well as duration as well as schedule. Or it could be one of the three. It need not be always present in a single patient. But sometimes all the three are present in a given patient. So what is its importance? Sir, uh, because uh, it can cause say, anemia in the patients and also like it is very common. It is seen once in three women, like 30% of the patients who come to our OPD will have complaints of heavy menstrual bleeding and will be diagnosed as AUB. Yeah, as you correctly said, we are mainly worried that these patients, if they are not recognized and treated, they will get into anemia but uh, more important than that, we should not be missing. Endometrial carcinoma. Yes, like, that, we should not that's... miss out in cases of endometrial CA. Exactly. So especially in an elderly patient, uh, AUB should not be brushed aside as it's common during menopause. Many uh, women think like that. And many doctors also do not know that it could be very serious. So uh, AUB in an elderly patient, especially near the menopause, what we call menopausal transition, should be investigated properly, thoroughly. Otherwise, they may have endometrial carcinoma, actually. Right? So, that's good. Yes. So, the impact, if you have to say that uh, there will be anxiety, obviously, because if the bleeding is irregular and if it is heavy, and then it decreases the work productivity, many a times you may have to away leave also. And that would lead to anemia, as you correctly said. And then there could be discomfort, because many of the times AUB is associated with pain. And then there will be negative impact in the relationship with the partners because the partner may think all the time my wife is having bleeding and though that could be a negative impact in the relationship. And finally, there is decrease in the it's quality of life. Yeah, correct. So major yes, impact sir. on a yes, woman's sir. quality of life because of this abnormal uterine bleeding. And over 60% of women end up with hysterectomy within five years. That is another major, major impact of the AUB. Whether there is malignancy or not, Many a times women get frustrated of the medical management and they themselves sometimes yes, request for hysterectomy, isn't it? You must have come across such cases. Yes, yeah. Yes, so, sir, and yes. hysterectomy has its own uh, complications and problems and, uh, you know, both in relationship as well as in her life. So about one third of hysterectomies for, you know, heavy menstrual bleeding result in removal of anatomically normal uterus. That is the tragedy. Oh, uterus. So because... Yes. The a woman uh, is frustrated or she is tired of taking tablets on a long-term basis and they themselves ask for hysterectomy. So yes. as I, uh, this is like a preamble or prelude to our case discussion. Uh, I always teach the undergraduates and postgraduates. There are only four symptoms in gynecology. The uh, last 40 years of my experience says there can't be any other symptom. What are these four symptoms? I always say one is abnormal bleeding, abnormal discharge, and the pain, and of course, the mask. Mask would be abdominal or vaginal. And I also say yes. 
there are only four diseases possible for not only in gynecology anywhere. One is congenital problem, inflammatory problem, which could be like an acquired problem. And then there is neoplasia, which could be benign or malignant. And finally, in OBG, there could be pregnancy-related problems. If it is not there, then it is a functional problem. Uh, it's a long talk. I would give some other time. Maybe it will be posted in my YouTube channel that how to make a quick diagnosis in gynecology. But today, let's move on. Okay. So before we move on, really, we need to just uh, ruminate once the old terminologies like menorrhagia, polymenorrhea, oligomenorrhea, metrorrhagia, because uh, these terminologies are still being used by many, many gynecologists. And uh, in day to day practice, sometimes we get confused with the uh, FIGO system. So before we go on to the FIGO system, let's just recapitulate. Do you know by chance uh, what are these old terminology? What do you mean by menorrhagia? So menorrhagia is uh, like commonly used for heavy menstrual bleeding. Any patient which is coming with complaint of heavy menstrual bleeding is menorrhagia. But uh, what is the most important? No, no, one minute. Uh, you are right, yes, heavy sir. menstrual bleeding. But what's the important clause there? One more clause you have to say. More than 80 ml of blood. Like, no, uh, that's correct. That is heavy. Like... But uh, one more important factor to be considered. Regular cycles. That's very important. Regular cycles. Heavy menstrual bleedings in a regular cycle is called menorrhagia. Okay. If it is irregular, it is not menorrhagia. Okay. It is some other name. What is polymenorrhea? Polymenorrhea, sir, will be uh, when the patient is getting frequent cycles, less than 21 days. If she is getting days. her periods, then Oligo? it is polymenorrhea. Oligo, Oligo is prolonged. Like uh, more, uh, than? more than 35 days, if there is a gap, then it is oligomenorrhea. Yeah, I usually used to teach undergraduates as it is a table of seven. Normal <laughs> is 28. That is seven, four times is 28. Seven threes are is 21 and seven fives are is 35. So this was very easy to remember, but now things do not go in that fashion. That's why FIGO has uh, tried to accommodate all sorts of different problems. Because if you interview 100 ladies, there will be 100 types of problems which cannot be fitted into these three definitions of menorrhagia, polymenorrhea, and oligomenorrhea. That's exactly why they have come up with a wider or more relaxed type of definitions. What is metrorrhagia? Metrorrhagia, sir... Uh... It is painful, heavy menstrual bleeding. Like pain component is also included. Yeah, also uh, it is referred to as intermenstrual bleeding or irregular bleeding is called metrorrhagia. Of course, there could be a component of pain in those patients also. Now, having recapitulated this, we all also should talk a, a sentence about DUB because this used to be my favorite, favorite topic. And I used to be very proud to teach my own uh, fellow PGs. Uh, it was very beautifully given in uh, Dewhurst, but unfortunately, now this terminology DUB is obsolete. But by chance, do you know what is DUB? What we used to so, call um, it in the past. If it yeah? is basically due to the ovulatory component, if there is an uh, absence of any organic disease in the genital tract, but despite that there is an abnormal bleeding present, it used to be called as DUB. Yeah, you correctly said in the current system, uh, we call it, we categorize it under ovulatory type of problems. Okay. We will, uh, you know, discuss in detail later. But yes, so there is no organic disease. That means there is no fibroid, there is no cancer, there is no nothing in the uterus or in the ovaries or anywhere else in the genital tract. Yet there is abnormal bleeding that was called dysfunctional uterine bleeding. So the functioning of the maybe the pituitary ovarian axis or the local hormonal milieu was at fault. So that was called dysfunctional uterine bleeding. And um, as I said, uh, it was either a functional problem in uterus or HPO axis or other part of the reproductive system. And the classification was also uniquely given in Dewhurst. That was, uh, as you can see here, third edition of 1986. After that, they have deleted this chapter in the subsequent editions. In the current ninth edition, you don't find this. So it was classified as primary, as you can see here, ovulatory or anovulatory, and then secondary, secondary due to some pathology. Again, this classification was defeating the definition when it is secondary to pathology. Now, but pathology, what 
was further explained as it's not organic pathology in the genital tract, but pathology outside the genital tract, maybe hyperthyroidism, hyperthyroidism. Endocrine problems. Endocrine problems. So outside the genital tract. So that was yes. called secondary DUB and finally secondary. atrogenic. So atrogenic also is incorporated in the current system, that is FIGO system, yes, uh, in a different way. So this is just recapitulating the old one. Now let us still uh, want to discuss few things because this would be like a base. Always I used yes. to tell the students that they would do, get confused. What's the difference between the theory and clinics? There is no difference as such. Unless you have a good theory knowledge, you cannot diagnose the cases. You don't know what to ask for. You don't know what to look for. You don't know what to ask for investigations. So let us finish off this in another couple of slides and then get into the case. Is that okay, Asti? Yes, sir. Okay, fine. So what is this new FIGO system one where the terminologies have been totally changed? You know, sometimes what happens is uh, people get bored, scientists get bored of using the same things. So they meet once in five years, 10 years, and they'll, they'll keep changing the terminologies. But this particular one is more uh, logical to accommodate, as I said earlier, different types of symptoms that a woman can have. So can you explain this? which has replaced yes, the old Yeah. So what yes, are the parameters? First, First parameter is, yeah. Frequency, sir. Uh, in which we have to understand what is normal and what is abnormal. So normal frequency will be if the periods are coming more than equal to 24 days, within more than equal to 24 days and less than Can equal you see to this? 38 it's days. such a big variation. In the old system, we used to say cycles are once in 28 days, which never happens. So here they are, they are yes. more relaxed. They have said anywhere between 24 to 30 days. Okay, such a wide range they have given. And that is probably close to nature. And abnormal will be classified as absent, in which there is no bleeding, which is also called as amenorrhea. Infrequent cycles, uh, that will be more than 38 days. If she is not getting system, periods for more than 38 days. days. In the old system, yes, it was 35 days. Now we, they are saying... 38 days because they have defined 24 to 38 as normal and infre or frequent that is polymenorrhea in the past which was 21 days now it is anything less than 24 less days. Less than 24 days. Yeah so earlier I the used second... to talk about the table of 7 now I am using the number 8. eight. So 8 threes are 24 and 8 for the 36 but anyway two, mass, uh, two days grace they have given. Okay so this is uh, what I want to highlight 38 and 24. Then they talk about duration. Yes, sir. Normal menstrual cycle can be something which is lasting less than equal to eight days. But it will be considered as a prolonged menstrual cycle if it is lasting more than eight days. That is yeah. abnormal. Correct. See, in the older days, as you also said, 80 ml, who is going to actually uh, you know, calculate this 80 ml and all that? It is very difficult yes, to sir. calculate 80 ml. So it's only theoretical. But this one is more... Uh, useful, especially for the patient to explain that I have had more than eight days or less than eight days, that itself will give an indication. Again, here the number eight comes, okay? More than eight or less than yes. eight. Then comes the... The third parameter is regularity. Um, in this, normal will be when the shortest to the longest cycle variation is within less to se equal to seven to nine days and irregular will be when shortest to longest cycle variation is more than eight to ten days. Yeah, so again, I can put it as eight almost, less than eight days or more than eight days is the difference between the longest and the shortest cycle. So this will tell us whether the cycles have been coming regularly or not regularly. See, what is the importance of all this? Suppose somebody says, my cycles are regular, what you can definitely rule out, Asti? Anovulatory, like there is no component of anovulation if the cycles are regular. That's, that's one thing I can rule out as far as the within the gynecological uh, HPO access system. Anything else, more importantly? Not... More importantly, mm -hmm. can you rule out something? Sub if the cycles are regular? Yes, you are right in saying that anovulatory cycles are ruled out. Anything else? But you can have still AUB even with the ovulatory cycles also. That should be remembered. But as far as the infertile patient is concerned, if the cycles are regular, more or less you can deduce that she must be ovulating. Yes. Sir. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let me explain this. 
again one more general formula i always teach the subject with the general formulas because you have to know the subject with the broader perspective with the conceptual perspective then only you will understand it probably better rather than going to small prints all the time see there are basically two types of bleeding what are the two types of bleeding yes, in a sir. woman what are they sir uh, one is like surface bleeding and the other one will be like uh, menstrual bleeding Excellent. So Excellent. That's, the, that's the answer I expected actually from you. Have you heard me before telling this sometime or you just knew it? No, sir. I've heard. <laughs> yeah, heard. Very good. So that's correct. Yes. So uh, if it is related to hormonal cycle, okay, that's one type of bleeding which is related to menses. Yes, Other one is the not related surface to hormonal bleeding. cycle, which is a surface bleeding. Yes, okay. If yes, the sir. cycles are regular, that means it is related to menstruation or hormonal menstruation. cycle. Whereas surface bleeding has no rhythm or rhyme. It can yes, come sir. anytime. Whenever the surface is denuded, the bleeding will occur. Which is the commonest cause of surface denudation? Mm. Listen, endometrial CA, it can have like... Very it, good. Uh, That's surface. what I want to... I uh, want all of you to understand today one important thing. If somebody has got uh, irregular bleeding in the back of the mind, you should always keep malignancy, especially in an elderly lady. Whereas, other way around, if the person says, I have got regular cycles, no in-between bleeding at all, more or less you can rule out malignancy in addition to ruling out an ovulation. Okay, so these two mm -hmm. things should be remembered clearly. Okay, right. So then, of course, we have volume. So here it is now, very subjective. Yeah. It is patient determined. Now we don't have any uh, specific amount to say yeah, that correct. it is heavy or low. Yeah. It will be patient determined. And if the patient says it's light, normal or heavy. Yeah, correct. So volume. it is very subjective. But of course, uh, you can indirectly find out how many pads you use, whether the fully soaked pads and all these things. Of course, if somebody is, uh, you know, uh, very keen on knowing if you are doing a research work or something like that, you can know all those things. But generally, we don't now bother at, about that. If the patient feels it is heavy, it's heavy. We have to just take her words. There are other parameters like intermenstrual bleeding. What is that? Intermenstrual bleeding is any bleeding within the cyclical regular onset of the menses. And uh, there is any bleeding in the middle. So it can be like uh, they have classified again normal and abnormal. Normal is when there is no intermenstrual bleeding or abnormal is when it is random or cyclical. So uh, random is again that surface bleeding and cyclical will be early cycle, mid cycle or late cycle bleeding. Yeah, this is in the past when the DUB chapter was there, which I used to love. They had beautifully described as irregular ripening and irregular shedding of the endometrium, which is happening in the uh, secretory phase, that is the late cycle. Mid-cycle bleeding is sometimes called middle smudge. Basically, it is ovulatory type of uh, bleeding. When ovulation occurs, there will be small pain, sometimes associated with the bleeding. And early cycle is something like a breakthrough bleeding. When the threshold of the estrogen, is, the estrogen goes down, there will be some amount of bleeding. So these all come under the intermenstrual bleeding. But as you correctly said, random bleeding is pointing towards malignancy. Very good. Let's continue. Then the other category is unscheduled bleeding. When the patient is on any progestin or any estrogen gonadal steroids in the form of birth control pills, rings, patches, or injections. So even, the even normal category devices, in, even intrauterine devices nowadays. Okay. So yes, this sir. is this was coming under iatrogenic in the past. So not applicable if gonadal steroids are not on medication, but it applies if she is on medication okay good yes sir. i think um one more question before we go on to your case what is this acute yes. and chronic aub acute aub is described as any episode of heavy menstrual bleeding which according to the clinician is sufficient to like require intervention so to minimize further or prevent further blood loss yeah this one that most is of the patients, acute yeah. Bleeding. yeah most of the patients uh, they just come to doctors only when there is heavy bleeding. Then only on probing, yes, they will say this has been there for two, three months or six months and things like that. The importance of this is that 
if the patient is coming with the first episode of heavy bleeding, you really cannot conclude anything unless there is an obvious cause that is found out, okay, on examination or on ultrasound and things like that. But we have to manage that, okay? Immediately, intervention yes, has to be given, either in the form of blood transfusion or whatever it is. But we cannot make a concrete diagnosis unless we follow up the patient and at least three months. Anything what yes, we sir. always give a time period of three months for any follow-up, minimum three months, right? Whereas chronic means... Yes. That it has been, like, patient has been having heavy menstrual bleeding for majority of the preceding six months. Yes. But there can be always acute on chronic, like in any acute other... Acute on chronic. Yeah. Okay, now I come to your case. You can present. Yes, sir. Um, sir, I'm presenting a case of 51-year-old Mrs. X belonging to a lower socioeconomic status who presented to our OPD with regular but prolonged heavy menstrual bleeding. She described that she was getting her periods within 28 to 30 days, but they were lasting for 10 to 15 days using five to six fully soaked pads associated with clots and disturbed sleep. She also complained of pain abdomen during menses, which was more on the day one for three months only. Yeah, so here are two points I want to highlight. Number one is patient is 51 year old. Like I told you, yes, to sir. make a quick diagnosis, I said there are four symptoms in gynecology, four diseases in gynecology. Similarly, we have to make three age groups in gynecology. Do you by chance know what yes, are the sir. three age groups we do? Sir, puberty, reproductive age and postmenopausal women. Yeah, that's correct. But uh, anyway, uh, we can just slightly modify it as instead of puberty, less than 20 years, which goes almost near that uh, group. And 20 to 40, because that is the reproductive yes. age group, as you correctly said. Instead of saying postmenopausal, we because nowadays the menopausal attainment has moved up to 55 and things like that. As you can see, this patient is only 51. She has not yet attained menopause and she is still having heavy bleeding. So anything more than 40, this is like a menopausal transition period or elderly period, wherein we have to be yes. much more careful with the symptom of abnormal bleeding. So this patient belongs to that category. So in the back of our mind, we have to think that I have to first rule out malignancy and then, of pregnancy. course, any benign conditions. And, of course, in this age group, pregnancy and related problems is very, very unlikely unless she has, uh, you know, a stray ovulation in between and things like that. And uh, inflammatory problems can still be there. Congenital problems are almost ruled out. This is how we have ruled to make a quick diagnosis in the back of the mind before we proceed. And as the history correctly uh, suggests, she has got regular periods, which means uh, sort of her annulation is okay. not so much, okay? And it is, yes, uh, again, malignancy sort of ruled out. Going by the history. Yes, sir. It can be, yes, I don't sir, know what is the is... case finally turns out to be, but going by the history that, you know, it's regular cycles, almost rules out. There is no intermenstrual bleeding. There intermenstrual is no bleeding. bleeding. Of course, these are the extra history that you should ask. In addition to asking yes, about sir. the pads, clots, and disturbed sleep and all that, you should ask a specific question if she's uh, still having, uh, you know, uh, with her husband, intercourse with her husband, then you should ask post-coital bleeding. Post -coital that bleeding. is very, very, very important. Of course, if a patient was menopausal, you must not forget to ask post-menopausal bleeding. Of course, we are discussing AUB mostly in the pre-menopausal age group, but there can be a AUB in the perimenopausal or po even post-menopausal sometimes. She has pain. Yes, so what does that mean? Two, two pathologies you can think of if there is pain. So one could be adenomyosis because yeah, that some, can also some cause Some sort pain. of inflammation. So as I said, there are only four yeah. conditions. One is congenital problem, inflammatory problem, uh, neoplastic problem and pregnancy related problem. If all the four problems are ruled out, it is functional problem. So pain suggests yes. inflammatory problem, inflammation inflammatory problem. endometriosis or adenomyosis or adenomyosis. there could be a neoplasia mostly benign. Isn't it? Because yes, the malignant neoplasia, the pain is the last symptom. Okay? Yes. And then other thing is, of course, what remains is infection with PID. So I think both obstetrics and gynecology is like mathematics. It is 2 plus 2 is almost 4. Uh, unlike in medicine where 2 plus 2 can be 3.9, 4.1 and sometimes 4. 
right? So it's very mathematical, not at all difficult to quickly get into a frame of mind. So we should start thinking by the time we start asking the history and by the time starts telling us about. I hope you are getting my logical thinking. Yeah? Yes, sir. Yeah, okay. So yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now, next thing, you read this and then you give and your And then comment. patient... Then the patient had visited with the same complaints at a local hospital and she was started on combined oral contraceptive pills two weeks back, following which her bleeding had stopped. Can you give me your comment on this? Is it? Mm. I, I don't want to say correct or wrong, but what is your comment? Would sir, you do that? Um, no, sir. First, we will evaluate why she is having heavy menstrual bleeding. Yeah, then plan to start her on we combined oral. Evaluate. We should not be blindly giving, especially hormonal treatment. Okay. If yes. the bleeding is heavy, there are very good non-hormonal treatments to stop the bleeding. If that is your intention, if your intention is to stop the bleeding, as we correctly said in the acute, that's why all our discussion now looks relevant. When a patient comes with acute bleeding, diagnosis is not first yes, thing who goes on on our mind. Our, uh, what is first on our mind is to how to stop this bleeding so that patient condition yes, doesn't reiterate. Once we control that, then we, our attention goes towards diagnosing. What happens if we give oral uh, or whatever hormonal treatment? Sir, um, the HPO axis, like because of the uh, exposure of the external hormones, like it will be disturbed. And also if we perform any endometrial sampling or anything, the results will be biased in there. Excellent. I am happy with the, your first answer as well as the second answer that is very important. When you give hormonal treatment and if you are planning to do an endometrial sampling to rule out malignancy, that will definitely confuse and mask the picture to the pathologist. They will simply give the diagnosis as pill endometrium. Yes, sir. And we are stuck. If your intention is to stop the bleeding, don't use hormone pills. And COC is the weakest hormone that you can use. Yes, sir. So we should not be doing this. Okay. That's why I'm happy that you brought this point out. I didn't delete this. I kept it so that I wanted to discuss this issue. I hope you have understood. Okay. And I'm happy that yes, you answered sir. correctly why hormones should not be used. Now you talk about this. And then the patient does not give any history of any syncope or breathlessness, any history of post coital or intermenstrual bleeding. Okay, she here does not you have any asked that. I'm happy that here you have asked there is no post coital or intermenstrual bleeding. It comes in a negative history. There is no history of any difficulty in urination or defecation. There is no history of any excessive white discharge, loss of appetite or significant weight loss. Like as other day I was telling Shreya, every negative history you must know if the examiner asks you, why did you ask this history? Can I now ask you, why did you ask history of difficulty in urination and defecation? What is the connection yes, between sir, this and bleeding? If there is a, sir, any uterine, like if there is mass effects, if there is a big fibroid, then does she have any pressure symptoms? Like, is there any acute re like retention of the urine? She is not able to pass urine properly. Or is there any increased frequency uh, in the during urination? Or there is a difficulty while defecating? during defecation. So that can give uh, give us a highlight if it is an anterior wall fibroid also and posterior wall fibroid. Okay. And what is, also if... Yeah. Go ahead. If you stop your answer and, uh, here, I will think that you are biased with your case because you already know the diagnosis. What else? You are so right. And, so far, whatever you said is right. But you should think of one more problem which can give these, prob uh, these symptoms. And even, sir, in malignancy, if there is already a spread, then it may be difficulty in urination or defecation. And okay. also, if there is a PID, then she might have burning micturation, symptoms of burning micturation, like associated UTI also can also be present. See, if I ask you a direct question, you will answer now. In endometriosis, we always say five Ds. One of them is, or rather two of them is dysuria and dyscathia. Mm -hmm. Right? Yes. Sir. So even endometriosis yes, will also give this kind of problem. So again, all our five differential diagnoses can give this problem. So again, I'm happy that you're thinking of all these things. Right. So uh, post coital bleeding and intermenstrual bleeding, we have already uh, said that it is an indication of malignancy. Same also the last one, that is loss of appetite or significant, significant. weight loss. Okay. Syncope and breathlessness may be 
tells us about the gravity anemia. of the bleeding. Yeah, gravity of the bleeding. Mm -hmm. If it's heavy, she would go for anemia. Since you have asked so many negative histories, uh, I would expect you to yes. ask some more negative histories. Can you think of some more? Mm -hmm. You have asked Sir, a good, um... good amount of negative history, but I would expect some more. If she's on any uh, chronic medication. Very like, good. Uh, Very good. What is that? Any, like if she is taking any heparin or any Excellent. or any blood history of any. Yeah. Thing, so um, there, there should be history of any medical disorder. She's having like a, an adult onset uh, thrombocytopenia. Thrombocyt that can also give rise to yes. it comes under C, right? Of the speaker system. Yes, sir. Medication, as you correctly said, anticoagulants and antipsychotics. Many a times, you, you also must have seen in your OPD, the psychiatry department, they send their patients to us with amenorrhea. And on examining, yes, on asking history, we know that they are taking antipsychotics. So would you stop antipsychotics yes, to get the menses or what would you do? No, sir. We will, uh, like, first we will refer to the psychologist only and most likely we will advise them to continue antipsychotics itself yes, and we will so counsel that it is a side effect of the drug very but good. we will not anyway, stop the drug yes. anyway my way of asking itself was would you do this means of course you should know that uh you should not do you should not stop okay and here you need to counsel the patient saying that amenorrhea is directly related to your antipsychotic drugs however having menses is not important right now unless she's her uh, you know, endometrium shows very thick endometrium, which probably requires uh, you know, withdrawal once in three months. Otherwise, you should convince her that taking antipsychotics is very important uh, for treating yes. that her uh, basic condition. Okay, But you have to do an ultrasound, uh, either a transvaginal sonography if she is an elderly lady, or if she is a young patient, then if it is uh, abdominal ultrasound, if the endometrium is thick, okay, that should not be yes. uh, left alone. Once in three yes. months, you can give a withdrawal bleeding. Okay. Withdrawal and bleeding. some more history like patient using contraception. This is not as a treatment, but sometimes they will be on COC pills and many a times they take irregularly. They don't tell us. Okay. And they may be having a yes. intrauterine device there, which may be cause of heavy bleeding. Right. So these are history yes, also. Sir. I'm just uh, adding. Okay. And then family yes, history sir. of bleeding. Family history of bleeding also is very important and easy bruisability. That could bruisability. be the first symptom of ATP, in fact. Okay. So this is just yes, to yes. just to give some complete picture. And uh, the more negative histories you tell with the uh, definition, uh, you are impressing the examiner more and more. See, the game of exam is just that you should demonstrate that last three years I have worked so hard and I have seen so many varieties of cases and I can just very logically think about all the problems. Uh, the more, see, that's the difference between one PG and another PG. You would have asked five negative histories. Another PG would have asked 10 negative histories. Okay. So that's the difference. Whereas the positive answers, yes. both of you will say the same thing. Positive findings. Yes. It's the negative history that you elaborate with the logic that gives you brownie points. Okay. So we'll continue. Yes. Okay. Obstetric history, sir. She is a para 3, living 3. She has had all full-term normal vaginal deliveries and her last child birth was 8 years back. What would be my comment on your first sentence? You find anything wrong there or everything is okay? Okay. So, there's nothing wrong as such. But when you say normal delivery, it is understood that it is full-term and vaginal. Yes. Isn't, isn't it? So you can simply yes, say sir, yeah, yes, normal. Yeah, you can simply you can simply say, I mean, this is like nitpicking. Uh, don't worry about this. I'm just saying that you know there is no need to say full term, normal, vaginal delivery. It is understood when you say normal deliveries. And then, of course, what is the yes, importance sir. of last childbirth? Sir, if the last childbirth was recent, then we can get history of like if she is lactating or any lactating right now or anything. Otherwise, uh, uh, even though if, if it is a recent childbirth, then there can also be other causes such as endometritis or anything that could also cause heavy menstrual bleeding. Very good. Uh, uh, one more thing. Yes, I, I agree with you. What you answered and, is very good. Anything else? And if also the last if childbirth is, was long back, what does it mean? 
there is a long unopposed estrogenic action, isn't it? Because every pregnancy is like an estrogen holiday. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Isn't it? So a long childbirth yes, is a recipe for you know, fibroids. It's an increased risk factor. Recipe yes, for endometrial, uh, you know, problems, hyperplasia and things like that. So that's the importance of last childbirth. So I'm, what is the next sentence? And uh, in surgical history, she also has a history of postpartum sterilization. What is wrong here? Eight years back only. So the... no, I, I didn't change this. Uh, you had sent me this. You can go back and check. Your case history says 20 years. I just purposely kept it. Uh, so you cannot uh, do this. This is obviously oversight or something must have happened, typographic error, but uh, you should be careful. Yes, okay. So it must yes, be sir. eight years back only. I just kept it like that uh, just to highlight this. Okay. Right. Sorry, now. sir. No problem. Okay. I'm Our just keeping everything as it is so that everything is learning, Asti, isn't it? Yes, Make, sir. Yes, making sir. a mistake is nothing to be shy about. Unless you have done it deliberately, uh, we can learn from that. Yes, sir. Yeah. When medical history, she gives a history of hypothyroidism. Uh, since three years, she's taking a uh, thyronom 150 microgram daily. And she's also known case of type 2 diabetes mellitus, which she was recently diagnosed three months back. And also diagnosed with hypertension two weeks back and started on tell me certain 40 mg daily. So In this is a history, perfect there recipe is no for history. what is called uh, corpus cancer syndrome. Have you heard of that? Yes, sir. What is that? Uh, it's, a high, it's, a, it's a combination of three things. Obesity, diabetes and hypertension. So, so it's an increased probably, risk for endometrial cancer. Yeah, so she has got all the three. She has got diabetes and recently hypertension also. And I have uh, seen your examination finding. She is on the higher side. That is obese only. So... All the yes. more. I, I mean, that doesn't mean everybody who is obese, diabetes and hypertension will have cancer. But in the back of mind, see, everything is in my, our back of mind. We don't have to tell the patient. Okay. But in the back of mind, this will help us to uh, ask for the investigations to rule out these kind of problems. Right. And you have written no gynecological yes, managers in the family. I'm happy you are a little bit specific, but you have to be more specific. Which cancer goes uh, hereditary? Sir, ovarian malignancy and endometrial, uh, this thing, we have to Endometrial see carcinoma. Okay, so you have to be more yes. specific, okay? No Lynch syndrome or yes. no breast cancer. Breast cancer also is very important, okay? Instead of uh, vaguely yes. putting it as gynecological malignancy, see, uh, other day I was talking about, you have simply written, no family history significant. But today you are written at least gynecological malignancy is not there. But again, I am trying to refine it by making more specific. Yes, sir. You have to be more specific. It, I mean, it's all just how smart you present yourself is the question. Because you should you should project yourself as that you are thinking of everything and you know everything. So that is one which clearly shows you in a better light compared to uh, others. Okay. Then, of yes. course, family history of bleeding disorders, we bleeding can disorder. add also. Okay. That's why I put it in red. Yes. And then easy breathability, which was discussed earlier. So what is your provisional diagnosis at this time? Maybe we will be finishing another one minute. We have to go for part two. Uh, do, it doesn't matter. We'll go tomorrow for part two. And today, let's uh, just try to end up with your provisional diagnosis at this level, history level. Sir, uh, I will tell her as a 51-year-old, para-3 living Cree, who has... Uh, just tell a few uh, different diagnoses quickly. Differential, sir, it could be a case of uh, endometrial CA. It could be a case of AUBL or uh, even AUB adenomyosis. And uh, because there is no symptoms of postcoital or uh, this thing, then CA cervix rules out. And even there is no history of any inter, 